Will they be destroyed? No. <clears throat> what will the nation look like during the seven year tribulation? Seven year tribulation? <coughs> Any ideas? Be some peace and then not peace. What about at the end of that? How's it going to look? Mm -hmm. At the end, because there's obviously going to be a period of time at the end of the tribulation, that the three and a half year mark, where things are going to go downhill pretty fast. Oh. Will the nation be destroyed at that point? No, it won't be destroyed. They may be scattered abroad, maybe. We're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about why the nation of Israel is so important. We're going to talk about their present, their past, their future. We're going to kind of bring that all to culmination today so that when next week we go into the rapture and we begin to look at the Antichrist and his rise to... to um, to a national figure or to a worldwide national figure, we're going to see exactly how Israel is going to play into that going forward. Uh, any questions up until this point of things we've talked about or that you can think of? Your, 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 because I don't want to leave you with any kind of points of confusion. <clears throat> is there anything that maybe before I dive into this? Because from this point forward, we're going to move at a fairly rapid pace. I feel like. Uh, so the things we've covered up until this point have been the, the, the attitude of the world, kind of the way things are going to look as we go forward, the makeup of the nations. I am not going to get into Ishmael and the Arab world. I feel like that may be a topic that needs to be all on its own. His 12 sons, I'm going to briefly mention it a little bit this morning because it has to, it has to be on that counterpart for, it, for Isaac. <clears throat> um, anything? Okay, so let's dive in here. Time after time, in Israel's long, troubled history, the Jews have faced possible extermination. Uh, beginning in somewhere around 1548 B.C., Amenhotep I was the first one to try to launch the nation's, the, the first extermination of the Jews. The first attempt was that long ago, and I, I, I think most of you probably remember when that happened. It was when he was the Pharaoh of Egypt, and he made a decree that all Hebrew male babies were to be tossed into the Nile River. Obviously, God did not decide that for that to happen, and uh, uh, he stepped in, and instead of extermination, the Jews actually experienced the exodus. And from that point on, the Jewish people have been a target of extermination, from the Assyrians to the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Spaniards, the Crusades. You can even go all the way down to Hitler and his Holocaust and his tyrannical movement against the Jewish people where millions and millions of Jews were killed at that time. But we see that they have always been a target of extermination. Why is that? Why couldn't they have just continued to be a nation? Why did they have to be desecrated completely? For over 4,000 years, the Jewish people seem to be different than any other civilization on this planet. All other countries, all other governments that have ever existed in history, they have been the only one that has been a distinct people with customs, with habits, with laws with, with that, that, that were specifically given to them. Um, even though that their history was filled with murder and terror, terror, and actually it seems like it was written, if you read or have ever read any of the Arabian Nights, it's almost just exactly what you find in the Jewish history books. But we see that even though they were oppressed and they were downtrodden, they've been scattered about through all of their nations or through all the nations of the world. What's interesting is that through all of this, they continue to rise up in the pages of history. It seems like it's one of those things, especially for the Arab world, they can't get rid of them. They want to so bad to be rid of the Israelite and the Jewish people, but they just won't go away. And so <clears throat> another interesting fact of, of, of the 
nation of Israel, and I, I read this several times and in several different articles, is that it's the only nation that has ever existed that can trace their lineage back as far as they can. All other great nations that have ever existed since Israel's birth have even perished. You look at the great Assyrian, the Persian, the Babylonians, all of those nations have completely been disintegrated. But even as the nation of Israel was dispersed and everybody had, 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 had been uh, moved to other nations, they were without a capital, they were without a government, they were without a flag, they were never once absorbed by another country. You can't say that about any other culture. So this means that these people had something very, very important that God has in store for them. Otherwise, as some of the other nations in the world, he would have let them completely just abandon them. He would have abandoned them, he would have forgotten them, they would not be nowhere. But they continue to come back again and again and again. The preservation of the Jewish people is called the miracle of history. The only way we can account for what this preservation has done for the Jewish people is because what God promised to them and through his chosen people through what? Does anyone know who gave these people a promise? Obviously God gave it. Who did he give it to? Abraham. That's right. <coughs> through the Abrahamic covenant. As a side note, how many covenants come before the Abrahamic covenant? Three. Let me set the scene for you of why God had to give Abraham this covenant. What was going on during the time that God needed to make sure that he absolutely set aside a certain people for a certain a purpose? Does anybody remember? How bad was the world during the time of Abraham? Pretty bad, pretty bad, right? So, the Tower of ba Babel episode was kind of a turning point in history, right? Up until that time, the entire human race was one unit. There was neither Jew nor Gentile. As a matter of fact, just as another side note, there's only three classes of people that the Bible mentions. I just named two. Can you name the other one? You said the Jew and the Gentile? I said the Jew and the Gentile. Samaritan. Not Samaritan. That was nationality. Classes of people. It was the church. And what's interesting about this is obviously the church doesn't come onto the scene until the New Testament. There was never a mention of a church in the Old Testament, but the church is made up of both Jew and Gentile. However, we see that in the church, or I'm sorry, outside the church, you have either you're a Jew of Jewish lineage or you're something else. You're a Gentile. Most everyone else is a Gentile. So, <clears throat> their whole race had become very idolatrous. God had to come up with a remedy for this, and so he decided to call out an individual. 412 years after the flood, God called Abraham, a Shemite from the Earl of Chaldees, to be the father of a new nation, a separated people for one specific purpose. And that purpose was to bring about the redemption of God's people. Now, <clears throat> This covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, was different from the other three covenants before it. You had the, uh, the, the Adamic covenant, you had the Noahic covenant, and then you had the Mosaic covenant. Those three specific covenants that were given. You have the fourth covenant that was a specific covenant given, given to the Israel, or I'm, I'm sorry, to the children of Israel, to the Jewish people specifically. <laughs> These other covenants dealt with the entire Gentile world, but this was the first covenant that was ever mentioned to be given to a specific type of people. So if you say, am I under the Abrahamic covenant, you would be like, absolutely, I am not under the Abrahamic covenant because it was given to a specific people, right? It was given to the Hebrew or the Jewish people, Abraham's son. Now, if we look at the actual covenant that was given to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Let's read that very quickly. It says, Now 
<clears throat> the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will, and, and him who dishonors you, I will curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. <clears throat> the most important part about this covenant is one thing. There is not one conditional statement in this entire covenant, nor can you find one in the Bible that says this covenant will only be accomplished if this is a conditional promise. It is unconditionally confirmed, if you will, and it then is enlarged in Genesis chapter 26 and in chapter 28 through Abraham's son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. Notice the seven promises that are encompassed in this covenant. One, I will make of thee a great nation. Was this fulfilled? Absolutely, it was fulfilled. National posterity as the dust of the earth, as it was said in Genesis chapter 17 and 20, which has been fulfilled through Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of the Arab or Islamic world. Isaac is the father of the Jewish world or of the Hebrews. And through them, they have been dispersed throughout all of the world. I mean, you could not count the number of descendants from Abraham. But not only that, the other promise that this actually had as a great nation was their spiritual posterity, which if you, mention, if you look in Genesis chapter 17 as well, it talks about the stars in the heaven. The second blessing or second promise of this, he says, I will bless thee. Now, not only was this a blessing of spiritual well-being, but it was also a blessing of uh, of flocks and of herds and of lands that was going to be given through Abraham. He was blessed abundantly through all of the things that God had given him materially, not only materially, but spiritually as well. The third promise was to make thy name great. I would say that next to Abraham, I'm, uh, Abraham, I'm sorry, next to Christ, is the one outstanding name in all the scriptures. He says the fourth promise, and thou shalt be a blessing. Abraham was a blessing to all of the people of his own time and of the world, and through him came who or whom? Who came through the seed of Abraham? The most important figure in history. Jesus. Jesus Christ. So, and thou shalt be a blessing is absolutely true. Number five, I will bless them that curse thee. Number six, and curse them that curseth thee. The last two here have, have wonderfully been fulfilled in past history. You can see that the Jewish people more wonderfully than any have been ones that if you have been on their side, you have been blessed. And if you have been opposed by them, some of those nations, as we spoke about earlier, have been completely destroyed. And that promise will continue all the way up until the millennial reign of Christ. When we see that Satan will attack, I'm sorry, not Satan. We see that the nations of the world will come upon and the Antichrist will break that treaty with Israel. And everything will go uh, south from that point. Now, this, the last and final one is in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Has this been fulfilled spiritually? Has this been fulfilled uh, in any way at all? If so, how? You can almost relate it to one of the previous ones that we had here. The promise was fulfilled, obviously, through Christ spiritually, and we're going to talk about the future fulfillment of this here shortly, and if not shortly, we'll cover it in a few weeks when we get to that point and we see what Israel actually does through the children, of, I'm sorry, what God does through the children of Israel. Uh one more side note, what's the sign of this covenant? Most all other sign, other covenants have a sign. We know that the Mosaic covenant had a sign, which was the rainbow. Rainbow. Oh, no, wait. The, no way. I'm the, sorry, yeah, I said the Mosaic. Right. Uh, but you're right. When you I did that, you're like, ah, oh, I got it. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, the Noahic covenant had a sign of the rainbow. What was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? Any idea? Come 
on. Somebody spit something out. I figured somebody <laughs> would know this. Circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, on that note, should our boys be circumcised to this day? Is this something spiritual that should happen to our young men that, that, uh, that as they come? Who does the Abrahamic covenant go with? Not us. Not us. Not us. Even more so, what did Christ say about circumcision? Or what did Paul say about circumcision? The gospel's neither for the circumcised or the uncircumcised, right? It's for all of, all humanity at all. So yeah, this didn't have anything to do with us being circumcised, but it, for them, yes, it, it had a lot to do with it. So as we get into their past, we see that it has just been one downtrodden moment after another since the destruction of the nation. As we look at their, 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 their present time, we see that even if you come up from the time of Solomon, when you see in B.C. 975, the kingdom was divided. How many tribes went south and how many tribes went north? Ten. Okay, and the tribe, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly right. That's ex and ten were the tribes were taken as, uh, uh, captive by the Assyrians. The other two were taken uh, captive by the Babylonians. And so the Babylonians took Jer Jerusalem and completely destroyed it in 587. So with the captivity of Judah and the destruction of Jerusalem, it began a period of time. Now, this is something that's very important because it's going to come up time and time again. This period of time, because the... The, the, the keys to the world dominion or the world rule had been given to Nebuchadnezzar. And I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. And so when we get to that, Nebuchadnezzar, had he taken it, could have gone as far as he wanted to. But now this period of time that started with that began the time of the Gentiles. The Jews were God's chosen people, but when they decided to fall into idolatry and they were carried off into captivity, they were supplanted as a people by the Gentiles. In the time of the Jews and Israel, they had ceased, but it will be taken up in the future. And even when they are they were allowed to rebuild the city and they were allowed to rebuild the temple, never again, up until 1948, and even now, you can't even say that they had a national supremacy, but they never again secured supremacy as a nation as what was promised through Abraham. <clears throat> Their state, even today, you see the Jewish people continues because of a curse that was put on them. <coughs> I found this very interesting, and I read this in multiple different document or commentaries. Ever since the Jewish people, when they were in Pilate's judgment hall and they pulled down on their head the curse that said, His blood be upon at us and our children. That's absolutely true. <coughs> there was, um, in the Mosaic Law, it was almost a curse and a blessing that was put upon them. And, uh, <coughs> You could almost say that you can't cur you can't curse the Jewish people because they've been blessed, and nor can you bless the Jewish people because they have been cursed. And that's so very, very true. It's almost like they can't find a way out, and that's going to continue until we get to the millennial reign of Christ. Now, as we see this, after that curse that they put upon their own heads, they have wandered from land to land, and they have wandered from graveyard to graveyard. Even if you look in Balaam's prophecy, Balaam was standing out over the valley, and he saw a mighty nation as he was looking down, and Balaam was, 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 was very much not a God-centered person at all, but he even admitted that the Holy Spirit had put the words on his lip, and he didn't want to say this. He wanted to lead the king into a different direction. But as he looked down upon the valley and he made this prophecy and it said that lo the people talking about Israel shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. One thing stands for sure about the Jewish people, people that no matter where the Jewish people are scattered, they will, because of multiple promises in the Old Testament, never be absorbed by any other nation, ever. They may be in different places in the world, but they will never be absorbed. The Jewish people to date 
are the most pure-blooded people in the world. It's amazing. Now, we do have exceptions to the rules. You do have where you see that the Jewish people is, uh, have married Americans. or, or uh, uh, But for the most part, because of their laws, because of the restrictions that they had given to them that they are still abiding by, it keeps them very much a nation that is pure, even though you have French Jews, German Jews, American Jews. These people are very pure-blooded overall more than any other nation in the world. And they are the only ones that can trace their lineage back as far as what they can. Israel stands in the blessings of God, both in Balaam's day that you see here, but he also the Hebrew people, it seems as though they might should be unworthy of God's uh, future that he has in store for them, doesn't it? We were unworthy as well. Tracy and I talked about this statement multiple times uh, the last couple of weeks. Two commentators said the same thing. <clears throat> they may falter and fail and be punished for it, but their destiny stands sure because it's based not on their national performance, but on God's promise to Abraham. It doesn't matter what happens to the Israel, Israel as a nation. It doesn't matter because God made the promise. And when God makes a promise, you can bet your very last dime or penny that you own that that promise is going to be fulfilled. And Israel stands on that blessing of God, both in Balaam's day and our day today. They might be very much, like I said, unworthy. And they are because of the curse that they put on them back in Matthew chapter 27 and, uh, 27 and verse 25 when they said, let the, his blood be on us and on our children. It didn't negate the Abrahamic covenant that God gave Abraham. It didn't supersede it in any way. It was still God made that promise, and if God makes a promise, you can guarantee that it's going to be taken to the, to the very end. <clears throat> God even confirmed this when Abraham was 100 years old. What was interesting, if you continue to read in Genesis, you will see that this covenant was specifically given to Isaac. That becomes very important that it wasn't given to Ishmael. It wasn't given to Ishmael. Now, you ask yourself, how does the Arab world, how do the, 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 those that believe that not see exactly what was written in Genesis? They have the Quran, but they do not believe that this was given to Isaac. That it was their inheritance that they are the ones who will fulfill this, which is the reason that they will go with Russia in the end time and they will fight till their dying breath to take over Israel and the country that they believe is theirs. <clears throat> so Abraham was in his 100th year when this, was, this, this unconditional promise was confirmed to him. And it says, And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and thy seed and in thy generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art strangers, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Make no mistake, when Israel is standing there in the midst of all of those Arab countries and they're standing there defeating, their, or de trying to just hold out the boundaries with the Iron Dome, isn't that what it's called, the Iron Dome that stands over Israel? Make no mistake that the countries will not overcome them because of the promises that were given to Abraham. It was confirmed to him when he was 100 years old. Not only that, it was confirmed as an unconditional promise to his son and to his grandson. Make no mistake when there is a promise made by God that it will be fulfilled. When we look at the nation of Israel and we said, and I've shown this several times, the royal grant, that blessing is going to come upon them. But the question is, when does that come? Does it come between now and the time of Daniel's 70th week or that beginning? Does it come during the midpoint when Chad was talking about earlier? <clears throat> We're not going to see the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant to its full extent and the royal grant that was given to Abraham until the millennial reign of Christ. 
God is going to graft those Jewish people back into the church or back into his blessings. He talks about the two sticks becoming one. We're talking about the ten tribes all coming back together. There's even a, prophet, a prophecy in Ezekiel that talks about how all of the people will be coming back to this land by air. It hasn't been up until the last 150 years or so that we see that the Israelites have been going back in hordes back to their home country. I'll talk about that as we go forward. But anyway, Israel's future is assured today because it was given by Abraham's covenant. Over and over in the Old Testament, I wanted to even show the, the, the number of scriptures that secure Israel's future as a nation. I wanted to go through that and do it, but there were so many scriptures, there's no way I could ever cover it in one lesson. It was amazing to me, starting in Daniel, starting in Ezekiel, starting in, I mean, well, starting in Genesis, all the way up. You can even go when you see in, in Luke and when you see in Romans that Paul's talking about what's going to happen with the future of Israel. It is a guaranteed promise that you're going to see. So when will this be fulfilled? I just told you when the time of the Gentiles has been fulfilled. We currently live from the time that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. From that time on, we live in the time of the Gentiles. And that will not end until we see the Israelites restored as a nation. And that will be when we see the millennial reign of Christ. Talking about prophecy and people coming back like I was just talking. I went back and I read Isaiah chapter 60 verse uh, specifically in that one. And there's an interesting prophecy that comes to mind. And, and, and this is what it said. <clears throat> Who are those that fly like a cloud and like doves to their windows? For the coastlands shall hope for me the ships of Tarshish first. To bring your children from afar, their silver and their gold with them, from the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has made you beautiful. This prophecy foretold of the Jews that were returned by the air like I was speaking about momentarily. This actually happened large scales. We see modern day Jews that have returned to the reborn state of Israel by planes and even more interesting is when Britain tried to give the Israelites a small strip of land in Uganda, they denied that piece of property because they knew their property lied where God had made the promise of. And so just like, and this, this author said it was like homing pigeons, God's promise was that they will have this. And so, yeah, Uganda wasn't going to work. Because they knew what the promise was, and they were going to fly back to the land that God had promised. And they were going, in, in the end, they're going to have a new spirit and a new, uh, a new heart. It's going to work out about right. Now the question becomes: Out of all of this, why did Israel have to fall? Why did the nation of Israel have to be completely destroyed, not to be rebuilt until the time of the millennial reign? What would be the purpose that God would allow that to be? Obviously, they fell into idolatry, right? What happened between that time when the, 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 the nation of Israel fell and up into our current time? What was the biggest event in, to happen to the Gentile people? Jesus. Jesus. But more importantly, what are you a part of? The church. Their fall was for our salvation. You say, how do you know that? If you look in Paul's letter when he was writing to the Romans, it actually says Paul was talking about the fall of the Jews. And he said, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles... That is, I guess, if you wanted to say giving of the gospel to the Gentiles uh, was, was such a blessing. How much more will their fullness be? Paul was trying to say here, how much greater will be the blessings for the world when the Jews rise up again and they take their place among the nation? He goes on to even say, he says, if the casting away of them be the reconciliation of the world. Did you hear that? If the casting of them be the reconciliation of the world. The Jews had to be destroyed. That nation had to be destroyed so that you could be reconciled through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had to come for the Gentiles and the Jews, but he had to come for us. So he says, 
that if the casting away of them be the reconciliation of the world, what shall be the receiving of them be but life from the dead? That the Jews will come back to God. It will be like a resurrection, but not just a resurrection of a people, but of an actual nation, a national restoration of Israel. Israel is important in this in, in this whole grand scheme of things because they will come back and they are going to rule here on earth with Jesus Christ. Their importance cannot be understated if we go forward. I'm going to mention them over and over and over. Next week I was going to talk about the rapture, but we need to talk about the Antichrist and his personality and kind of where he's coming from. Um, I, 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 I'm still kind of pondering how we're going to get into that. It's either going to be the one of the two. It may be the rapture and it may be the Antichrist and how he's going to kind of come to fall. But I want you to get an idea of his personality and what he's what we're going to be looking at. Um, and, and, and I say this again, he very well may be alive today. He very well may be a small child or a young adult that is getting ready to bring a peace about in the world. We don't know. We know that God's going to come back in the twinkling of an eye for us. We don't know exactly what time, but we do know that the Antichrist will be rising up out of the midst of the new European Union that will have a 10 Confederate state. Okay, I know that's a lot of information. I know it's kind of like, wow, why did you say all of this? But I felt like you needed to know the history of why it's important that Israel be where they are. Any questions? Anything I might have lost you on? I felt like I had a lot of gazes that were just like, what are you talking about? Did it make sense? You can say no. Well, I mean, to mention is that the Jews, the, the only way for them to come back is through Jesus. That's it. So just it. because they're Jews, if they still reject Jesus Christ, well, they're on their way to hell. Absolutely. And as a nation, they will turn from what all of those things that transpire, the breaking of the seals, the blowing of the trumpets, all of those things that transpire have to do specifically with the Jewish people. Yeah, the Gentiles are going to suffer, but you're absolutely right. It's to bring them to focus on God and to say, wow, we made a mistake whenever we didn't accept Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everything we talk about all falls back to Jesus. Either looking forward or looking back, it all falls back. Good point. Anything else? Way too deep? No? Okay. Cool. Mm. Expand upon it? No? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> okay. Um, if there's nothing else, then I guess let's bow our heads unless somebody has something to mention. Anything? What's the uh, period of time of the time of the Gentiles? The current period of time, the time of the Gentiles. That period of time will end. <clears throat> Anything else? I had a blank. Okay. What was the? Why was it important that he gave the Isaac? Why was it important? Okay, so I hope maybe that I didn't actually say that in class. Why was it important? It was important because otherwise, if it had been given to Ishmael, it would have been given to the Arab world, right? We would need to be following uh, um, Islam. But it was important because it was given to Isaac, and Isaac was the future in the nation of Israel. And so that's where our hope lied through that lineage and through David to where we get Jesus Christ. So it was very important that we got it through Isaac and not Ishmael. Okay, two good questions. Any more? Let's bow our heads.